waiting for people to join. Hi. Hello. So we have got Flick Hardingham speaking today. So I'm just going to wait for her to join the video. A little bit about Flick. So I met Flick at an event several years ago. We were sat next to each other and the rest is history. So Flick is an amazing, very inspiring individual. And it's been really wonderful to watch her journey over the last few years. So she's an, an award-winning consultant and a professional coach. And she specializes in being an ally to those with chronic and persistent pain. So many of us have I can see that she's just joined, so I'm going to wait for her. Here we go. Hang on. Just waiting for her. She should pop up any minute. Connecting. Hello. Hey, Emma. Voila. Thanks for starting that lovely intro. Nice to see you. It's, yeah, good. That was that was nice and easy. You just never know with technology, right? And whether yeah. this is going to. This is my first Instagram live as well. So I'm like, which buttons do I press? But actually it's remarkably easy. Well, you look, you look like an angel because you've got a bright light behind you. <laughs> it's not even a filter. It's like the windows of my flat. Yeah. Hackney is angelic today. <laughs> you've got rays. Uh, um, yeah. Anyway, I don't want to take um, precious time away from you. I'm going to hand the floor to you. But I just wanted to say that, so Flick is going to talk about the latest chronic pain science, helping us understand how the mind and state of mind can cause or worsen symptoms, which I'm really interested in, including headache, migraine, IBS, back pain and fibromyalgia. And many of those um, ailments, I guess, we don't, we don't hear enough about. We only hear what the doctor says or what the clinician says. So I think what Flick is going to speak about um, will be very inspiring. And she's also going to talk through to the greatest insights that supported her recovery journey. So over to you, Flick, and thank you. I will sit and listen. Okay, lovely. Okay, so as Emma mentioned, I'm Flick. Um, I'm a company culture consultant and a coach. And I also have a chronic headache. Um, so I'm still on my recovery journey, but it's going well. But I got a chronic headache about five years ago. It'll be five years in March. And what that means is that I have a headache 24 hours a day. So to, like, it, to give you some understanding of what that feels like, it feels like I'm just massively hungover all the time and I have pain around like my neck, my head and my shoulders. So when I got a headache five years ago, I, and nothing happened, I didn't get hit on the head, there was nothing dramatic that, made, that, that caused it. So I went down this huge road of trying to figure out what was wrong with me. Um, and I actually think bar putting monkey poo up my bum, which was suggested to me, and is still on my list of like emergency strategies to try. I tried everything. I saw chiropractors, osteopaths, uh, cranial sacral therapists, MRI scans, healers, crystals, injecting myself with coenzyme Q10, adrenals, diaphragm, like literally, I had thorough MOTs from very experienced professionals, including the top neurologist on Harley Street, who was 300 quid for a 20 minute appointment and got it wrong. So um, I was completely flummoxed for about three and a half years, I was really searching and not getting any results. And that was causing a lot of stress in my life. And quite frankly, I thought I'm gonna have this forever. Mm -hmm. But then which I finally, sorry? Which is terrifying, right? A That's absolutely terrifying. Um, just not an option that I wanted to entertain. And the NHS were equally unhelpful in this journey. But eventually, as I was digging, 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 I came across this group of wonderful doctors and therapists and people who understand the mind-body connection and understand how mind impacts body. And in fact, I don't really like the term mind-body connection because it implies that they're separate and there's a bridge between, and really I'm seeing that they're just one. So now I'm on a mission to help people understand how our state of mind impacts our physical body. 
and and what you can do about it to reduce or eliminate your symptoms altogether and that's my new mission so i'm helping people through one-to-one -one coaching and also launching a social enterprise called nova tribe which will help with that so um word of warning i'm obviously not a doctor i can't diagnose you've got to go to the right professional and get everything ruled out but i would just invite you to get really curious because my intuition throughout this journey has been telling me it's not, there's something else going on here. And that's why I kept digging and that's why I ended up finding the right people. So just get curious. And I'm gonna spark your curiosity with two interesting kind of stories that will show you that there's, there's not really much correlation between chronic pain and that's pain that lasts over three months, uh, six months generally, three or six months and damage. So there was this Vietnam war veteran who got a really bad injury in his leg during the war and he recovered, the pain went away. 20 years later, when he's back home in the States, he hears a helicopter overhead and gets a searing pain in the sight of the injury in his leg. And what happened there was no physical damage. His brain had just heard the helicopter, perceived threat, and that learned pathway had been kicked off again. So that kind of thing got me curious, like what's, what's the deal with pain? Is pain always a reliable indicator of damage? Uh, another interesting study happened in 2014 where they did a survey of 30-year-olds and found that 50% of 30-year-olds in their survey had disc degeneration and 40% had bulging discs, but none of those people had pain. Another study looked at 1,100 people with back pain and only 1% of them had abnormal damage to their back. So you start to see that there's not much of a correlation between pain and physical damage. And this got me really, really curious. And I was like, okay, so what is going on? So as I hinted earlier, it's all in our brain. Once you've ruled out um, autoimmune disease and cancers and anything really dangerous with a, with a proper doctor that understands this stuff, pain that's recurring, so that might be like a migraine that you get regularly or chronic pain, and that could be a fibromyalgia, IBS, uh, repetitive strain injury, back pain is the most common one. It's caused by the brain, not by the area of the body that's hurting. Um, and the science behind this, which I'll try and sum up in a nutshell for you, is basically what happened with me was over the last 20 to 30 years, I have had some really stressful thinking, nothing like super debilitating, but just low level stressful thinking around my body image or perfectionism, being a high achiever at school and then at work and doing people pleasing to make sure that people don't reject me. All this low level thinking that I was taking really, really, really seriously. And what that does is it drip feeds stress hormones into your system all the time, 24 hours a day. So you've got glucose, norepinephrine, adrenaline and cortisol, just drip, 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 drip. So our bodies are okay with a bit of stress hormone. In fact, they're built for it. If a tiger came into my kitchen, my body would flood with those hormones and I'd go into fight, flight, or freeze. Really useful if there's a tiger in the room, not so useful just because I'm having some bad thoughts. So when you've got this low level drip feed all the time, it rewires and causes dysfunction in your body and it impacts your immune system, your hormone system, and your nervous system. So my nervous system became so dysregulated, it became super sensitive, um, and very aware of threat. And that could be just threatful, stressful thinking. And that leads to a change in these functions. It reduces your blood flow, causes oxygen deprivation, which leads to pain. And that's why I have the chronic pain. And the research shows that this isn't just about pain. It's also chronic fatigue syndrome. Burnout is a really acute example of this. Fertility issues, eczema. There's many kind of like chronic conditions which more traditional medicine is finding hard to tackle and this is often the root of it. So I'm inviting you to, to get curious. You know your body best, like follow your intuition. Do you notice that your symptoms go up and down depending on the level of stress? I certainly did. Like at the weekend, they'd go down. I'd go on holiday and it would practically disappear. I'd be distracted by a really good movie or with some friends and I wouldn't notice the pain. So start noticing. Tune into your intuition and just think like, what feels right for me? You need to get stuff checked with a doctor, but be aware that a lot of people unfortunately don't have this knowledge. So 
if, if you want more research and um, resources, I'm so happy to share stuff that's specific to your problem or more generally around these chronic conditions. So I'd like to jump to just sharing two of the big insights that I've had for my healing journey. So I think this is the most important thing I have learned. I was like, okay, I've got all this stressful thinking. I need to get rid of it. And then my nervous system will relax and I won't be in pain anymore because that's what happens. You can reduce your symptoms or eliminate them entirely once you've rewired the nervous system back to normal. So I was like, okay, I'm going to do everything I can to de-stress. I'm going to see the right coaches, the right therapists. I'm going to reframe all my thinking. I'm going to do affirmations every day. I'm going to do yoga every day. I'm going to meditate five times a day. And I've learned two things about this. It created more stress in my system because I was so aware of all these things I had to be doing. I was like keeping a checklist all the time. If I haven't meditated today, it's going to, I'm going to be ill. It was creating so much stress in my system. And the second thing I realized was I was like, as soon as a stressful thought entered my head about my health or my relationship or work, I would be like, get my guards together to like fight this stressful thought. And that was just creating more stress in my symptoms system. Now the coaches I'm working with now have helped me understand that when a stressful thought comes into my head, there's nothing I need to do about it. I used to perceive it as a massive threat. In fact, I've, I've had quite stressful, busy thinking about doing this live because it's like the first time I've spoken about this. It's the first time I've done an Instagram live. My face is on a camera. There's lots of busy, like busy thinking and I can feel like busyness in my body to do with that thinking as well. But what I've realized is that's okay. And there's nothing I need to do to get rid of it. So a metaphor um, my mentor John uses is to think about stressful thinking as being passengers on a bus. So bear with me for a minute. Imagine you are a bus and when you have a thought, it's a passenger coming on the bus. So this passenger comes on the bus and sits down. Now, if it's a stressful thought, what I used to do is the conductor of the bus would go, oh no, there's a stressful thought. We've got to go and fight with it and get it off and it would create all this ruckus and different thoughts would come on board and it would create more stress. What I've started to see now is that passenger on the bus, that thought is going to get off the bus. Just like all thoughts get off the bus and all passengers are built to get off the bus. They stay on the bus and they stay in my body and in my head if I engage with them and I'm thinking and I'm ruminating and I'm trying to solve it. What works is when I just let the passenger be and then it gets off the bus and I don't care that it's there. I mean, sure, it's not nice to have unpleasant thoughts in your head. It doesn't feel comfortable. No one likes that person on the bus that stinks a bit or is really noisy on their phone, but they're gonna get off if we leave them well alone. And it's exactly the same with my thinking. So I've realized like the, any stressful thinking I had about doing this IG live with Emma, I don't care that it's there, it's gonna go. So that's kind of my first big insight and a second one I'll share with you um, fairly briefly, because I know we're tight on time, is build your tribe. So Emma knows all about tribe building and how important it is. Yes, it is like the guest house poem by Rumi. Yes, I encourage everyone to look that up. Um, so, yeah, build your tribe because chronic pain, chronic conditions suck. You feel bad all the time. The afternoons I've spent in bed, the number of invitations I've turned down, the frustration I've had about not being able to work and literally feel like I'm banging my head against a wall. It's, it's, it's a lot to carry and you need a tribe to help you. So um, there was a big barrier for me there because I'm used to being quite capable and doing things on my own. So it was hard for me to like reach out to people and say, I'm really suffering. Because also with chronic pain, you know, no one tell, can tell I'm ill and I'm very good at acting like I'm well and everything's fine. So for me to like share what I was going through and be vulnerable in that way and ask for help was hard, but people are awesome and it, it was fine. And what I've realized with 
building your tribe is you need to find that group of people who treat you or they treat me like I'm the capable, intelligent person that I am at my core. Because chronic pain and chronic illness and any kind of challenging situation in life, it beats your confidence down. You feel like your sense of value and your sense of confidence just gets completely flattened. And if you've got people treating you like you're a sick person that needs serious worrying about, then it can make it worse. It's not empowering. So it's those people that treat you like you're intelligent, you're capable, you're on it. If you have a bad day, you get angry, you get frustrated, that's okay. Because that's okay for anyone. Not even just because you're in pain, it's okay for anyone to have a bad day. So they treat you like you're capable. They bring me their problems so I know I'm capable and they, they still can lean on me for support as well. And they act as an antidote to other people because some people innocently, and I stress innocently, don't understand this is a really difficult experience and they might judge how you're dealing with it. They might give you bucket loads of pity, which might not be very empowering. Um, I've been told regularly to drink more water, which is like, it's very innocent stuff. But when you're in a low place, like you need antidotes and your tribe can really be antidotes to that type of people. So just, just to round up, I just want to leave you with three things to start thinking about. This whole stressful thinking leading to physical symptoms thing could that apply could it might not be the whole picture for you but could it be part of the picture get curious and if you want more research there's a ton online and i'm very happy to send it to people secondly can you reframe how you think about stressful thinking sure declutter your lives so they're simple and you're kind of taking as much stress out of your life as possible but does stressful thinking in your body need to be a real threat to you and the third thing is build that tribe because those people like I think one of them's watching now maybe but like I have three sisters one's in LA which means I have sisters to call 24 hours a day if I'm in a pit and I have wonderful inspiring women like Emma who have been through challenges and show me the way forward and I have a great network of friends as well so build that tribe so um, if you'd like to get in touch, you can find me on, oh, I have two sisters here today. Hey, Kaz and Penny, nice to see you. The other one's in LA, so she's probably asleep. Um, so please do get in touch. You can find me on LinkedIn at Flick Hardingham, or my email is flick at wearehabit.com, or obviously I'm, I'm on Instagram at wearehabit. If you want to learn more about the social enterprise or speak to me about one-to-one -one coaching to help with chronic pain, reducing symptoms and recovery, I'm, I'm really happy to share any more research and you can pick my brains as much as you like. Thank you. Really nice to spend this time with you all. Have a nice afternoon. Um, stay, stay Emma, there. So just, got any questions? Yeah. Um, stay there. Thank you. I'd like, it's so interesting what you say. I'm just going to get a book. One sec. Come on. Um, this book... Yes, The Body Keeps the Score by Gabor Mate. Yeah. It's a really uh, good introduction to understanding the connection. Yeah. Van de Kook. It's oh, Bezzel sorry. Van. Wrong author. Okay. So, um, this book, a lot of what you say is resonating with me. Mm -hmm. I'm working through a particular anxiety at the moment that I'm going to share more about in time. But a lot of what you say resonates because of how our body physically shows up, even even when it's our brain when it's not physical damage exactly as you're saying or you're not actually ill mm -hmm. um this book is a really wonderful book as you say it's very accessible and it's very interesting i learned a huge amount um from it when i read it before i went to the trauma train i didn't it talks about what you say with with thoughts and also emotions and being able to sit sit with them as mm. opposed to way which is really very hard to do but also our brains our brains um positive thinking is like um teflon negative thinking's like uh, velcro so if you've got negative here positive here really annoyingly our brain if it has the choice it'll go over here it's like oh oh negative thought oh yes please i'm gonna go here um, but we can, as, as you say, with more gentleness and kindness and compassion, we can help ourselves lead the way to our mm. positive.
I really like that analogy of the bus and I'm totally going to take mm. that. It's really good because what I've noticed is you say like the less attention you give negative thoughts, yeah. the less they come. That's what I've seen. Like yeah. if I don't care that there's a smelly passenger on the bus, yeah. I don't care them and then they stop coming. Yeah. Um, because it's and impossible do, to keep negative thoughts out of our system all the time. It's yeah. an impossible task. So let's change our relationship with them instead. Yeah. 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 It's uncomfortable, for sure. It's a journey. Oh, God. It's, and it, <laughs> I'm like, just, I don't want to feel like this. <laughs> but I have to. And you do become more it's aware. Easy. Becoming more yeah. aware makes you more aware of your negative thoughts which therefore can be hard but it's 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 all a process i could i could talk to you for for hours but um well <laughs> keep us short but thank you all yeah. for Vic, thank you so much for giving thank your you time and high five to you for sharing that to us and your first instagram live and i'm really <laughs> excited about where your nova tribe takes you so you. big love to you thank you emma Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.